So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today is part three of the Rachel Nickel case. That's right, this is a three-parter. This is the finale though, so if you haven't seen part one and two, feel free to go and catch up now. I'll link them both up here in the eye. You kind of need to watch both of those before you watch this one, otherwise this one won't make any sense. But with that out of the way, I just want to thank our sponsor for making this video possible, June's Journey. June's Journey is a hidden object murder mystery mobile game app that is free to download on both iOS and Android devices. In the game, you get to solve your very own murder mystery story and you get to crack the case of who murdered June Parker's sister. Each hidden object scene reveals more and more clues that become leads that take you further and further into the story. And these hidden object scenes are beautiful, by the way. The game is set in the 1930s, so everything is super cute, super vintage, super authentic to that. It's a really nice, relaxing game to play, like at the end of a long day when you're in the bath or when you cuddle up into bed at night. It's all the intriguing, mysterious elements of a murder mystery, but none of the scary ones, so it's perfect to play on a night. I get scared easily, especially when it's dark outside, and I can play this on a night. <laughs> and they've recently launched some new features on the game that I have been loving. So for example, there is the detectives lounge. You can create your own detectives club or join an existing one, and you get to play with your friends. Your club can climb the competition board, and you even have the chance to win some cool prizes. Another new feature on the game are the leagues. Here you get to take part in weekly tournaments with your club, climb the divisions, and again, there's prizes to be won. So if you wanna try your hand at solving your very own murder, you can click the link down below in the description to go and download June's Journey for free. I've been playing the game for years and I'm still as interested in it today as I have been the whole time I've had it. And I know if you're watching my channel right now, you wanna know what it feels like to solve your own case. So go click the link down below in the description. Quickly, before we get into part three, I do just wanna give some content warnings for this particular part. We are gonna be talking about the murder of a child. There are themes of domestic abuse, sexual assault, sexual assault of a child. This is quite a heavy video. So if that is something that you don't think you wanna watch right now, feel free to click out. Honestly, I won't be offended. Please look after yourself. I'm sure I'll see you again with a different case that's maybe a little bit more suitable for you. But with all that being said, if you're ready for part three, let's just jump into it. 23 year old Rachel Nickel was murdered in 1992 on Wimbledon Common in London. Right now in the case, we're about 10 years later. So we're in 2002. And for the last 10 years, police have had their eyes on one guy and one guy only. And that was Colin Stagg. They tried to coax a confession out of Colin Stagg in the most unethical way possible, but he just wouldn't give them one. And for good reason, because he wasn't the murderer. DNA evidence literally proved that Colin Stagg was not Rachel Nickel's murderer, although he'd been branded her murderer for the last 10 years by the media and the public. But now, with advancements in technology since 1992, police were able to test the DNA that they had that they believed belonged to Rachel Nickel's murderer against the criminal database. And finally, they had a match. The results came back as a match to serial rapist and known murderer, Robert Knapper. At this point in the case, Robert Knapper was in his 40s, but he was around 26 years old at the time of Rachel Nickel's murder. Born on February 25th, 1966, and raised in Plumstead, Southeast London, Robert Knapper was the oldest of four children to Brian and Pauline Knapper. And the environment that Robert Knapper was raised in was just awful. He witnessed severe domestic abuse from his father to his mother almost every single day as he was growing up. When he was around seven, some sources say seven, some say nine, his parents finally divorced and he would no longer have to witness this abuse every single day, but that didn't mean that his childhood was about to get any easier. His father just walked out and left his mother and she was left with all four children and she just couldn't do it. She didn't have the money, she didn't have, you know, the mental state to be able to care for four children all alone right now. And so all four of them had to be put into foster care. I believe they were all given some sort of therapy on the NHS, the National Health Service, to be able to deal with the abuse 
that they watched and witnessed through their whole childhood. So the state was well aware of Robert Napper's situation and his sibling's situation and kind of what they'd gone through in order to be in foster care right now. And it was around this time when he started seeing a child psychiatrist that this professional noticed that Robert Napper functioned a little bit differently to other children. So he was given a formal assessment and the results of that came back and Robert Napper was diagnosed with Asperger's, which is now under the blanket term of the autistic spectrum. After a few years in foster care, all four of the children were finally given back to their mother and she was now, you know, in a, in a better place, in a place where she felt that she could care for these four kids. And everything was looking up. It was looking like the Napper family were finally gonna be a happy little unit. They could now all be together but it wasn't gonna be that way for long. When Robert Napper was 12, he and his whole family went on a camping trip with, uh, you know, all the extended family. There were uncles, there were cousins, literally so many people on this camping trip. And at one point, Robert Napper was sexually assaulted by a close family friend. And this incident is believed to have changed Robert Napper completely. His whole personality just changed his whole demeanor was changed forever. He used to be quite an adventurous, outgoing, confident, happy, bubbly child, but now that same kid was quiet and reserved and he actually became a recluse. He didn't wanna go out, he didn't wanna see anyone, he didn't wanna go anywhere. Robert Napper didn't have many friends in school. He was actually bullied quite badly because he was the weird kid. The kids in his school said that they bullied him because he was just weird and socially awkward and he did things differently to the other kids, but they were awful to him. Like it wasn't just verbal bullying of like calling him weird, it was like, pushing him over in the playground, throwing things at him. They would hit him occasionally. Like he was abused in school. It wasn't bullying, It well it was, but it was also abuse. So yeah, he didn't have friends in school. He didn't have that kind of support network as all of this was going on that he could go to and feel safe. He just felt horrid all day, every day at school. And when he would get back home at the end of the day, Robert Napper would take out these frustrations and these negative emotions on his siblings. All of his siblings were younger than him and they were easier targets than the kids at school. So Robert Napper would get home and he would be violent. He would be pushing and punching his brothers and sisters. And it was around this time in his life, in his preteens to early teens, that Robert Napper was actually caught multiple times spying on his younger sister as she got changed. And this was where his mother drew the line. She felt like her son had to be some level of mentally ill to, to do that to his sister, to see his sister in a sexual light and to spy on her multiple times after he'd been punished and told that it was wrong. He still kept going back and doing it. Not only was it his sister and incest, but she was also a lot younger than he was. Like there was a, a lot behind this and his mother was very worried. So she took him to a child psychiatrist and I don't know if this was what she was really expecting, but Robert Napper was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Through his childhood, there had been a few um, warning signs or symptoms of this. And I think they'd just kind of been brushed under the rug, just like, oh, that's just kids but Robert Napper was a pathological liar. This continued for the rest of his life, which I believe is a characteristic in some cases of paranoid schizophrenia. And his parents just thought, well, you know, kids do lie sometimes, you know, to get attention or to get people to like them or to seem interesting. But the lies that Robert Napper would tell were just, they were crazy. He would tell people that he had been kidnapped, he'd had his fingers cut off and they'd grown back. He would tell people that he met the queen, that he had all these prestigious awards and just none of it was true. He was just such a normal kid, like he'd never met the queen. When Robert Napper turned 16, he left school and he went and got a job in a kitchen. I think he was like a, like a little assistant chef or something. But it was at this point when he left school that you would think that his behavior at home would get better because he's no longer being bullied. But that wasn't the case. Well, it was actually quite the opposite. His behavior only got worse and worse and he was 
acting weirder and weirder around his sister. And at this point, his mother had had enough and she kicked him out of the house. Robert Napper went and got his own place. He got himself a bed sit and he got a new job at a factory. And you know, that was his life. His life was just very average. He was employed in this minimum wage job. He didn't have any friends that he saw on weekends. His life was very repetitive. It was like, wake up, go to work, come home, go to bed, wake up, go back to work, you know? When he was 20 years old, Robert Napper got in trouble with the police for the first time because he was carrying an air gun. And not only was he in possession of this air gun, but it was also fully loaded when he was just walking the streets with it. I don't suppose it was really a proper run-in with police because nothing really came of it. He had the gun confiscated, he, get, he was given a warning, a note was put on his record, but he didn't actually get like a criminal record. He wasn't charged with anything. He was just told off and sent on his way. But it was around that same time that Robert Napper began committing smaller, sexual crimes that would eventually get worse and worse and just snowball out of control. He started off um, flashing women on the street, indecent exposure, he would peep through women's windows, like watch them as they got changed. But before long, these smaller sexual assault, sexual harassment kind of acts were no longer satisfying that urge that he had and he knew he needed to do something more. Robert Napper actually lived very close to this kind of nature walking trail called the Green Chain Walk in southeast London. It basically connected all these different um boroughs, boroughs? Places in southeast London. It was just a kind of easy pedestrian commute between all these places. It was very naturey. it had grass and bushes and trees either side of it pretty much the whole way. So this meant that, especially in the dark, it was a rather concealed place, an easy place to hide. A perfect place to commit a crime and not be seen or maybe to escape to after committing a crime. If you were to go on the green chain walk, you would be able to get away from the scene of the crime rather quickly. So in August of 1989, Robert Napper decides to go out onto green chain walk and see what opportunities he had. And that was when he noticed a house pretty close to one of the entrances of the trail and the back door of this particular house was wide open. Now this isn't completely unusual for people in Britain to do in the summer because our houses are not designed for hot weather. We have major insulation in our houses because it does get really cold over here and we have no air conditioning. So when your house gets really hot, there is literally nothing else you can do other than open every single window, every single door and try and get all of that hot air out. So if you trust your neighborhood, this is quite a, you know, not a weird thing for people to do just to leave the doors open to let the fresh air in. But Robert saw this as his golden opportunity because this house actually belonged to a young mother and her two kids. And he could see through the front window that those two kids were distracted by the TV. They were fixed on it. You know, he could easily sneak in that house and get straight past them. And that is exactly what Robert Napper did. He ran down to the house, snuck in through the open back door, crept past the kids who were sitting in the living room. He went straight upstairs to where he knew the mother was. She'd actually just gotten out of the shower. So she walked back into her bedroom. She was about to start drying her hair. And then when she lifted up to take the towel off of her head, she saw Robert Napper standing in the doorway with a knife in his hand. As soon as she saw him, she almost screamed, but she stopped herself because she didn't want to scare her children. And Robert Napper told her that if she was to make a single sound, then he would kill her children. And of course, this woman, she was willing to do whatever she had to do to keep her children safe. He said, if you do everything I say, no one will get hurt. Robert Napper then proceeded to rape this woman in her own home at knife point while her two children were just downstairs. When he was done, he stood up and started getting dressed again. And he turned to this woman and said, 
you know, you should probably keep your doors locked. He then ran straight out of the house, ran up onto the green chain walk, and presumably went straight home while this woman called the police. They were able to take a DNA sample from her body of this rapist, and they tested it against the criminal DNA database, and there were no matches at this point in time. So it was clear to police that this was probably this person's first attack. Since they hadn't been caught for anything before, their DNA wasn't in the database, this wasn't a repeat offender. And because no results came up on the database, not much more could be done. I mean, there was nothing else police could do. There were no cameras around, there were no witnesses. So Robert Knapper, got away with his first rape. A few months later, in October of that year, Robert actually ended up confessing to his mother that he had done this. He told her everything, like in detail as well, every part of it that he'd snuck in past the kids, that he'd done it in her own home, that he'd then left onto the green chain walk, and rightfully, his mother was horrified. She couldn't believe what her son was saying to her. And when he left that day, his mother rang the police and said, look, my son has just confessed to raping a woman. And this is one of the most frustrating things because his mother called over and gave his name, you know, said, he has just confessed to me, please look into this because I know there's a woman out there that has been raped and has not had any justice. Police could have caught Robert Knapper then and there if they'd literally just looked into it if they'd literally just gone and interviewed him or tested his DNA against the DNA they got from the woman, but they didn't do any of that. I mean, obviously, it's it's the police in the UK. What did you expect? Did you actually expect them to look into it? They didn't do anything. <laughs> absolutely anything. It's so infuriating. They didn't get in contact with him, didn't take DNA, they didn't bring him into the station, they didn't arrest him, they didn't even go to his house to talk to him. And so Robert Knapper was just out on the streets, free to strike again. And of course he did. He went on to commit so, so many similar attacks, mainly on Green Chain Walk. And unbelievably, he was able to avoid police detection the whole time. He became known in those areas as the Green Chain Rapist. Of course, they didn't know who the Green Chain Rapist was because he wasn't identified. That was just his kind of criminal nickname. And he managed to commit over a hundred crimes on 80 different women, at least 80 different women, before he was finally apprehended. So you can imagine this guy's reign of terror was so long, so horrifying, so scary for the people that lived near Green Chain Walk. His next attack after the home invasion, he was on a bus one day when he saw this woman and he decided that she would be his next victim. He followed her off the bus and into a nearby alleyway where he then proceeded to rape her. The next attack after that, I'm not going to go through every single one because there are so many, but the one after that, he actually, he actually went about this one in a, in a bit of a different way. He approached a woman who was sat on a park bench and he sat with her for about five minutes and they had a conversation, just a normal conversation. And then suddenly out of nowhere, he just switched and attacked her. These attacks would escalate with brutality and violence almost every single time, to the point where he began using a knife, he was raping these women at knife point, but eventually even that wasn't enough for Robert Knapper, and he began actually stabbing the women in the breasts. He wasn't trying to kill them, he just wanted to inflict superficial wounds. He just wanted to see that blood and commit that act. There was a whole police unit set up to try to investigate these attacks. It was called the Green Chain Enquiry. And it turned out that the police officers on the Green Chain Enquiry had actually been in contact with the officers on Rachel Nickel's murder inquiry right in the beginning, right when Rachel was first murdered. The Green Chain officers basically went up to them and said, look, we've got all of these cases over here that look worryingly similar to the murder that you guys are currently investigating. Maybe sh we should like join forces. Maybe we're looking for the same guy. But the officers on Rachel's case just kind of dismissed them. They really didn't believe that they were looking for the same guy. There were a few reasons for this. They just didn't think that they were linked. They didn't think that Rachel's murder was linked to all of these attacks 
for a few reasons. I mean, there was quite an amount of geographical distance between them. Rachel was murdered in southwest London and all of the Green Chain attacks were in southeast. I don't know exactly how far away those places are from each other, but I'll put a bit of a map from Plumstead to Wimbledon. And of course, with the criminal profile that Paul Britton made of Rachel Nickel's murderer, they believed that her killer probably lived within like a mile of Wimbledon Common. So they really didn't think that the person that was doing so many attacks over here would travel so far to Wimbledon Common to commit one murder. There was also the fact that there was a bit of a time gap between them as well. I don't know, you can see it from both officers' sides. You can understand why Rachel and Nickel's team were not believing that they were linked, but you can also see why the Green Chain Inquiry thought that they were. The theory was shut down very quickly by the Rachel and Nickel murder inquiry team, although the Green Chain officers always, always thought that they were linked. Like, for years afterwards, they were quite angry that the other team had just shut them down so fast. But the one thing that really sticks out to me as a connection between these two cases is the type of victim that was often targeted. Rachel Nickel was a young mother walking alone with her young child. And so were a lot of the women that the Green Chain Rapist attacked. The rapist preyed on these women specifically because they were alone, they were defenseless, and they were willing to do whatever it took to make sure that their kids were safe. So if he was to approach them with a knife and say, do whatever I say and I won't hurt your kids, they would do whatever he said. But anyway, it was shut down, so moving on. At this point in the Green Chain Inquiry, a sketch was made of the rapist based on a few survivors' uh, memories. And this sketch was put out all over the news in hopes that any of the victims could come forward or anyone that recognised the sketch could get in contact with police. And they did. They got so many calls, did the police, and a lot of them were actually giving over Robert Knapper's name. So this time police did decide to look into it and they got in contact with Robert Knapper and they asked him to come down to the police station to give a DNA sample. And Robert said, yeah, 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 okay, we'll do. And then he never turned up. So police got back in contact and they were like, hey, please will you come and give us that DNA sample that you said you were gonna give us? And he was like, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I will do, I'll come down. And again, he never turned up. So that was twice that he said he would give this sample and twice that he failed to turn up. And you would think that at this point, police would be suspicious thinking, why does this guy not wanna give us a sample so bad? Why is he avoiding this so much? But again, this is the UK police, so why would you think that? Why would you think they would think logically? They decided to just give up. Just give up. You know, imagine. Imagine giving up when this man is actively avoiding giving a DNA sample. So they gave up for a while, and then I think his name was brought up again, and so they were like, oh, yeah, maybe we shouldn't have given up so easy. So they tried one last time. This time, they actually sent two junior officers out to his house to go and speak with him in person so that he couldn't just kind of shrug it off. The junior officers got there and they were like, hey, uh, can we have a DNA sample, whatever, whatever. And somehow, Robert Knapper managed to get the conversation off of him and off of his DNA sample and stuff like that to the point where the junior officers just kind of forgot why they were there. These two officers also concluded that Robert Knapper seemed a little bit too tall to be the Green Chain Rapist. From all of the victim descriptions that they'd given of their attacker, they'd said that the rapist was about five foot 10. Robert Knapper, I think, was like six foot two. So he was quite a tall guy and they weren't looking for someone that tall. So the junior officers ruled him out of the investigation because he was a few inches off of what they thought he should be. So instead of doubling down, they were just like, oh well, thank you for your time. You know, it's probably not him anyway. And they left without a DNA sample. They left without a DNA sample. They tried three times and because he was a, a few inches taller than they thought he was gonna be, they were just like, oh, never mind. It's so infuriating. This whole case is so infuriating. And just a few weeks after the police just let him go, just forgot about him, Robert Knapper committed his worst attack yet. This time, it was another young mother walking with her two-year-old daughter in a pram. Napper waited around a corner for the woman to walk past. So he, say there was a wall here, 
he was here and this woman was walking this way. So as soon as she got past him, he jumped out and from behind, he took a rope and threw it around her neck and pulled her back with it. He dragged her into the bushes on the side of the trail and violently raped her in broad daylight as her daughter was laying in her pram just feet away. He beat her, he strangled her. This one was so violent. And then he just got up and ran away. This one was just a month before Rachel Nichols' murder. And I personally think it bears a lot of similarities to her murder. A young mother alone with her child is ambushed and dragged into nature where she is then assaulted. I think it's insane that the Rachel Nichol murder inquiry team were able to look at the green chain rapes and say, no, don't think that's the same guy. Anyway, a few months later in October of 1992, at this point, Rachel Nickel is already murdered. That investigation is on its way, but they're kind of already looking into Colin Stagg. But separately in the green chain investigation, police almost got very close to realizing what kind of guy Robert Knapper was. Because at this point in his life, he was being investigated for stalking a female police officer, I think. As part of this investigation, police went and searched Robert Knapper's home and there they found so much. They found so many weapons. There was a pistol, ammunition for that pistol. There was a crossbow. There were arrows for that crossbow. Are they called crossbow bolts? There were two large knives. There were just so many weapons in this guy's house for some reason. And for possession of all of this, Robert Napper was put on trial where the judge said that he feared that Napper was a very, very dangerous person capable of horrific things. The judge said that Napper would likely be a danger to society in coming years. He was sentenced to eight weeks in prison for possession of the gun and ammunition, which of course did absolutely nothing. Robert Napper was released and he was right back to his old ways. A year later, in late 1993, it was now about a year and a half since Rachel Nichols' murder. And of course, at this point in her investigation, police were so tunnel vision on Colin Stagg. And it was at this point that the news broke of a double murder on the opposite side of London. It was another young mother murdered along with her child. 27 year old single mother, Samantha Bissett, better known as Sam, lived with her four year old daughter, Jasmine. Sam was known to be a very strong minded woman. She was a proud feminist. She was very passionate about social issues. And she was even more passionate about her daughter, Jasmine, and giving her the best possible life that she could. Sam has been described as a very devoted mother and her whole life practically revolved around her daughter Jasmine. Sam had a boyfriend at the time of her murder. His name was Conrad and he got on amazingly with her daughter. He actually lived with them at the time. Sam and Conrad were serious. You know, they planned on spending the rest of their lives together. They were so passionate about each other. He loved Jasmine. You know, they were such a happy little family. They were kind of in the starting stages of their family. They were saving up for a deposit for a house. And what is so devastating about this case was that it was actually Conrad that found Sam and her daughter Jasmine's bodies. Conrad had been away for the night. I think he'd been at his father's house and he came back to the house that he shared with Sam and Jasmine and he tried the door and it was locked. So he just thought that they'd gone out for the day maybe. So he got his key out, he unlocked the door, he walked in and straight away he notices this huge dark stain in the carpet on the ground. And he remembers thinking that's really weird. You know, if Sam spilled a drink or something, why has she not cleaned it up? But it's whatever, Conrad decided that he was gonna clean it up for her. So he went into the kitchen to go and grab a cloth to do it. And once he got in there, he saw that the whole place was just in disarray. There was this one particular cupboard in the kitchen that Sam would keep all of her folded clothes in and that cupboard was opened and all of the contents of it, all of the clothes in there were just sprawled all over the floor. Conrad couldn't understand what had gone on. Why would Sam do that? Sam wouldn't do that. So in that moment, he got this little flash of panic, like, oh God, like has the house been burgled? Have we been robbed? So he ran to the living room to try and find Sam and as soon as he opened the door, that was when he saw her body 
laying on the floor of the living room. It took him a few seconds to realize what he was looking at because I suppose luckily for him, her body had been covered by her murderer. All he could really see were her hands and feet sticking out and her head at the top. He couldn't actually see anything underneath and it's, it's probably a good thing he didn't see that. Immediately when he looked at Sam, he knew she was dead. You know, there was no doubt in his mind that she was sleeping or that she was just injured. You know, he knew that she was dead on the ground. And so he ran to the phone to go and call emergency services, call 999. And that was when he remembered that Jasmine was home with Sam that day. He thought maybe Jasmine was still alive somewhere. So he ran upstairs to where Jasmine was asleep in her cot. He couldn't really see her too much because she too was under her blanket, but he watched her for a second and he noticed that she wasn't breathing. So he ran back downstairs to the phone to call 999. So the forensic team arrived at the scene and this has been described as one of the most gruesome murder scenes this police force had ever seen. It was actually so bad that the crime scene photographer, the person that took all the pictures of Sam's body and the scene, actually had to take two years leave off of work due to mental health reasons. They just couldn't physically turn up to work at that job again. There was an autopsy carried out on Sam Bissett's body and it was found that her cause of death was from 60 different stab wounds to her neck and chest primarily. It's believed that the killer had actually gained access to the house through one of the windows that was left unlocked because like I said, the door was locked when Conrad got there. So Sam had done everything right. She'd locked the door when she knew that her and her daughter were home alone so that no one could get in. But he still managed to gain access through the window. It's believed that the attacker ambushed Sam in the hallway. That was where the attack began. That was where they began stabbing her. And it's believed that that was where she was actually killed. It's believed she was actually killed pretty fast, even though she had 60 stab wounds all over her body in total. I think she died after a few of the first ones. This was clearly a very frenzied attack. You know, there was a lot of emotion and a lot of adrenaline in the killer. You can tell from the way that they carried this out, the amount of stab wounds. So they killed Sam in the hallway and then they dragged her body into the living room and laid her out on the floor where they continued the attack when she was already dead. The killer sexually assaulted her when she was dead and then they proceeded to mutilate her body. I think they carved some symbols or something like that into her skin and then they began cutting parts of her out. There was actually one part of her abdomen that was never recovered. So it's believed that the killer took a piece of Sam Bissett away as a trophy. But not before going upstairs to where four-year-old Jasmine Bissett was asleep in her cot. The killer sexually assaulted her too and then smothered her to death. They then escaped back out through that same window that they'd gained access through and they left behind one of the most gruesome scenes. So police spoke with Sam's boyfriend, Conrad, and asked him if he had any idea of anyone that might wanna do this to Sam, because it seemed as though she was targeted specifically, and due to the amount of stab wounds and how frenzied this attack was, it seemed like there was emotion behind it, but Conrad really couldn't think of anyone. Sam didn't have any enemies. She was a really cool, chill person, you know, she didn't, make people mad. But he did mention one particular thing that he was quite concerned about, and that was that Sam had been mentioning in the run-up to her murder that she felt as though she was being watched and stalked. Conrad said that Sam would often walk around the house naked and she had no curtains, no blinds, like no coverings on the windows. And the amount of times that he would say to her, watch out, like you don't know who is looking through the windows. Especially when it's dark outside and she lived right next to a load of trees and alleyways, like there were so many places that a person could hide and just watch her through the windows. But she was always quite chill about it. She didn't take it too, too seriously until about a week before her murder when Sam actually looked out of the window and caught a man looking in on her. And Conrad told police that he thought maybe that guy had come back to kill her. Maybe he was watching her and stalking her and finding out her routine, 
waiting for Conrad to leave her alone because he was there all the time, what's the chances that someone would break in on the one day that he's not there? So he felt like that man that was watching Sam about a week earlier had been watching her for a while and waiting for the perfect opportunity to break in and murder her. Thankfully, there was some crime scene evidence. With Rachel Nickel's murder, there was absolutely nothing. Whereas with this one, they were able to get a pretty perfect shoe print in the blood as well as a full fingerprint from the scene. But this fingerprint actually wasn't found for a while because the killer's fingerprint actually coincidentally was very, very similar to Sam Bissett's, which the chances of that happening are so low. Everyone's fingerprints are completely unique to them, but of course with however many billions of people there's ever been on this earth, the chances of you having a very, very similar fingerprint to someone else is there. It's not likely, but it's there. And in this case, the killer and Sam Bissett had very similar fingerprints. So for a while, crime scene investigators had seen this fingerprint and just mistaken it for one of Sam's until on a closer look, they noticed that it was slightly different. So they did end up getting this fingerprint eventually, but they didn't get it for a long time. And so in that time that it took to get it, they were trying to do some other things in the investigation to keep it moving. And that was when the lead investigator on this case remembered about the Green Chain Rapist. The crimes were very, very similar. The Green Chain Rapist always targeted young women, young mothers with their children. That's exactly what Sam and Jasmine were. A knife was used in all the attacks. Sam even lived quite close to the Green Chain Walk, so could this have been the same guy? Most serial rapists or just serial criminals in general tend to get worse and worse and worse over time. They have a natural progression of the more they get away with, the more they want to do. So they tend to progress from smaller crimes to slightly bigger ones to slightly bigger ones until eventually they do get up to things like murder. So it did make sense that the green chain rapist would eventually escalate to murder at some point. And this had been predicted. You know, people said, if they don't catch this guy, he's probably gonna go on to killing people soon. So once again, police on the green chain rapist um, investigation, they brought in Paul Britton, the same criminal psychologist that had made the criminal profile of Rachel Nickel's murderer was now making a profile of the Green Chain Rapist. And what do you know? It was almost completely identical. A young, single loner with pretty much all the same traits as Rachel Nickel's murderer had. So they knew they were looking for a very similar person, yet somehow the cases still were not linked. Anyway, finally, at this point in the case, the fingerprint was found to be that of the murderers. And so they took it for testing against the criminal database and a match was found on this database. It was Robert Knapper's fingerprint. But the thing about this fingerprint was that it wasn't inside the house. It wasn't on Sam Bissett's body. It was actually on a railing outside of the house. It's a railing that they believe he jumped to get into the house and then when he climbed out of the window, he jumped the railing again to get out. So they knew it wasn't the most damning evidence because he could easily come back and be like, oh, you know, I know someone that lives in that area. So the likelihood of me touching that railing before in my life is quite high. If the fingerprint was on Sam Bissett's body, then they would have had him then and there but with it being on the railing, it's not that easy. So they knew they were gonna have to try and find some other supporting evidence alongside it. It was still a good piece of evidence, but still. So they put Robert Knapper on 24 hour surveillance and they watched him everywhere he went. They followed him on buses, on tubes. They saw him um, looking in the window of a few weapons shops, like looking at knives in windows and stuff like that. But then towards the end of the first day of his surveillance, Robert Knapper started, like when he would get on the tube, he would go a few stops too many or a few too little, and then he would walk the rest of his way to his destination. So police quickly realized that Robert Knapper probably knew he was being followed and he was doing all these things on purpose. And he wasn't really doing anything to incriminate himself anyway, so police decided to just abort that operation because it was all going a mess already. He already knew that they were onto him. So they decided instead to go back to the police station and look into Robert Knapper's criminal history because, you know, he 
had a big one. And they found all the records from when he was in possession of all of those weapons a couple of years ago. So now they were even more suspicious of this guy, but that wasn't even the end of it. Investigators on this inquiry very quickly learned that he had been asked to come forward to the police station twice to give a DNA test, both times he avoided it, and then a third time police officers came to his house, again, somehow he avoided giving a DNA test, and this was just the cherry on top. This was a mad suspicious guy that was avoiding giving his DNA because, well, maybe he knew that he was the killer and as soon as he gave his DNA, it was game over. So police decided to move in and arrest Robert Knapper on suspicion of the double rape and murder of the Bissett family. So they brought him into the police station and got a search warrant for his home and they began the search while he was having an interview at the same time. So we'll talk about the search first. In his home, they found a metal toolbox that was painted red and a lot of this red paint was like chipping away. Inside this toolbox, they found found two knives. I think there could have been a gun in there as well, but the most interesting thing they found in there was a map of Southeast London. Actually, no, I think it was the whole of London. I think it was a London map, but a lot of the areas, particularly in Southeast London, were circled. He'd like made loads of little marks on this map and detectives quickly put two and two together that every single place there was a circle on this map there had been one of the green chain attacks. So was this map Robert Knapper's crime log? Was this him keeping a memory of each of the attacks that he'd committed? On an even closer look of this map as well, one of these circles was actually found to be Sam and Jasmine Bissett's home. Had he gone and murdered those two girls and then come back home and circled their house on his map? In Napa's house, they also found a pair of trainers and the sole on these trainers perfectly matched the full footprint that they had at the Bissett home. So detectives immediately were convinced that not only did they have their double murderer, but they probably also had the green chain rapist there in police custody. In May of 1994, Robert Napa was officially charged with both the rape and murder of Sam and Jasmine Bissett, but also two more rapes and two more attempted rapes from Green Chain. The reason he was only managed to get charged for four of these attacks when we know there was like a hundred was due to the evidence. That's the frustrating and heartbreaking thing about a lot of sexual assault cases is that it's so, so hard to get evidence for them because there's often not any witnesses and maybe DNA wasn't taken fast enough and things like that. Robert Napper is believed to be responsible for, like I say, a hundred crimes. All of the green chain rapes as well, but because there's not enough evidence, he was only charged with those four. Robert Napper was due to stand trial at the Old Bailey in 1995 for the double murder that he committed. And he decided to actually plead guilty to manslaughter, not to murder, to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. His team argued that Robert Knapper was clinically insane at the time that he committed the double murder. His schizophrenia was acting up and he went and committed this double murder in the middle of some kind of episode. The court agreed that Robert Knapper was not criminally responsible for his murders, but he had still murdered two people. And so for that reason, he wasn't sent to prison but he was sent to a psychiatric unit indefinitely. But Robert Knapper wasn't sent to just any old psychiatric unit. He was sent to the infamous Broadmoor Hospital for the criminally insane. And this was a place where, at least in the 90s, most of the people in there were notorious criminals. Murderers, serial killers, rapists, serial rapists. These were some of the UK's worst criminals ever, but because they had mental illnesses, they couldn't be sent to prison and so they were sent to Broadmoor. Some of their most infamous patients include the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe, The Devil's Daughter, Sharon Carr, John Straffen, all of which I've done videos on, by the way, I'll link them up in the eye if you wanna see those after you finish watching this one. But anyway, finally, that brings us back to the timeline of Rachel Nickell's murder. We have strayed so far from this timeline, I'm so sorry. It's now like, 14 years on from her murder, and they are finally able to test this DNA sample against the criminal database. 
and a match has come up. Of course, it was Robert Knapper. And this whole time, police had just completely disregarded him as a suspect. They never even so much as looked into him in connection with Rachel Nickel's murder. They were just so caught up with Colin Stagg that that was where they put all their time, effort, money, funding, literally everything was on Colin Stagg, who later turned out to be innocent. But now there was unmistakable black and white evidence that Robert Knapper had murdered Rachel Nickel. Robert Knapper was interviewed about this and he denied all involvement in Rachel's murder, but I mean, your DNA was literally on her. He actually denied being in Wimbledon at all that day and police kind of believed him until they managed to look back through loads of different logs and they found that he actually had an appointment that day in Wimbledon for some kind of psychiatric assessment or a, a mental health session. And the office where this session was due to take place was very close to Wimbledon Common. And also going back to that map, the crime map that he circled everywhere that he'd done an attack, Wimbledon Common was also circled. And that was the only one on the west of London that was circled. The rest of them were southeast. And if you wanna go even further with this, the red toolbox that the map was found in, in Robert Knapper's home, like I said, it was painted red and the paint was chipping away. Now going back to the day of Rachel Nickel's murder, I mentioned right at the start of the first video that when Alex was recovered by the police and the ambulance and stuff, they found some red paint chips in his hair. I'm sure you can see where this is going. Those paint chips were taken out of his hair and kept as evidence. And now they were finally tested against this red toolbox of Robert Knapper's and they were a match. They, they were the exact same paint. It turned out that Rachel Nickel's murder was Robert Knapper's first ever murder that he committed. And maybe it was then that he realized that he didn't really like murdering outside. The risk was too high. There was too much chance of being seen. And maybe that's why when it came to the Bissett murders, he decided to do a home invasion instead because it seemed that with Sam Bissett, it was more about the aftermath of the murder and the mutilation and the carving and the and the everything that he did to her. Maybe he just didn't get chance to do that to Rachel Nickel because it was outdoors and he felt like he was gonna get caught any minute. And so maybe that's why he decided to do a home invasion next time. So he would have more time and more freedom to do whatever he wanted with his victim. So in 2008, 16 years on from Rachel Nickel's murder, Robert Knapper was taken back on trial because he was charged with it, finally. Once again, he pled guilty to manslaughter, not murder, manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility for the exact same reason. He was not mentally sound at the time of the murder. This made absolutely no difference to his sentence because he was already sentenced to stay at Broadmoor indefinitely, probably for the rest of his life. So, I mean, nothing was gonna change there. But this was more just for the legal recognition that he was responsible for this. In the eyes of the law, he is now Rachel Nickel's murderer, finally. This meant that Rachel got some justice. Colin Stagg finally had his name cleared after 16 years. The family finally had some answers and finally this case was closed. So just to summarize this whole case, like I said earlier on, Colin Stagg was paid a lot of money in compensation for the whole ordeal that he'd been through but he wasn't the only one that was paid any kind of compensation. Lizzie James, actually, the undercover policewoman from Operation Edzel, she actually tried to sue the police. This was essentially for ruining her career with this operation, with this huge unethical operation that they put her in. She felt like it ruined her career, it ruined her mental health. She was under a lot of psychological distress through the whole operation and also afterwards when it all came out that, that they did all that. This was eventually settled outside of court and Lizzie James was paid about 125,000 pounds, which is quite a lot. Well, I mean, it is a lot, but I mean, it's quite a lot to say that she was, you know, 
consenting in the whole thing. So she was given £125,000 and she took an early retirement from her job. And there's been mixed opinions on that, on her being paid that fee. So I'll let you all sound off in the comments down below. Do you think it's um, warranted or not? One of the main issues that people actually have with her being paid £125,000 is because Alex Hanscom, Rachel Nickel's own two-year-old son that witnessed his mother being murdered, he was paid some compensation for obviously everything that he'd been through. And the money that he was paid was supposed to go to things like um, therapy sessions, different costs like that that would help him get over what he witnessed that day. And the amount that Alex was awarded was £22,000. £22,000 for therapy for the rest of his life, whereas this other woman got 125000 for writing sexual fantasy letters. Now, I don't want to downplay Miss Liz's struggles here because I'm sure there was an element of, you know, her career being ruined and her mental state being played on after this. But I mean, surely Alex Hanscom does deserve a little more compensation than an undercover police woman. There have been a few books written about this case if you're interested in any of those. Alex Hanscom himself actually wrote a book called Letting Go. Rachel's boyfriend Andre also wrote a book called The Last Thursday in July and Colin Stagg wrote two different books on the matter. One of them was called Who Really Killed Rachel and I think that was released before Robert Napper was even part of this investigation so quite outdated, but I bet it would be quite an interesting read actually, now that you know the ending of the case, to maybe go back and read a perspective from in the middle when they didn't know how it was gonna end. And Colin Stagg's more recent book is named Pariah. By the way, just a little bit of an update on Alex Hanscom. He is doing really well from what I could see in my research. He was, or maybe he still is, working as a yoga instructor over in Barcelona. He just seems like a very, very, positive person, even after everything that he's been through. He just seems very um, spiritually at peace with the situation. He doesn't hold grudges and negative emotions because he knows that the only person that that harms is himself. He just tries to remember the good times with his mother for what they were. He says he doesn't remember too much about her, but the main thing that he does remember is the overwhelming feeling of just true love. He remembers that they had just such a unique and special connection and that is what he holds on to from Rachel. But that is all I have on this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. I know it was a long one, but I really hope you enjoyed all three parts on this. It took a long, long time to research and I'm sure it's gonna take Jack a long, long time to edit. So leave your appreciation down in the comments for editor Jack as well. Thanks again to June's Journey for sponsoring this video. Remember, if you want to download the game and try your hand at solving your very own murder, click the link down below in the description to download it for free on iOS or Android. Huge thank you to all of my channel members for helping me decide the cases that I cover, especially my tier two members whose names are all on screen right now. If you want to become a channel member you can just click the join button on a desktop or there'll be a link in the description of this video. But yeah thank you so so much for watching. If you enjoyed please leave a thumbs up down below because that would really help me out. If you want to subscribe you can click this link right here to do so. If you want to subscribe to my second channel there'll be a link right here and if you want to watch another video of mine there'll be a playlist on screen right now. Bye!